So I think we might just begin to make a start. So welcome everybody. Thank you for coming for another Collecting the West seminar. Um, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that of course, um, other than our British colleagues, we are standing on Indigenous country that has never been ceded and thank their elders past, present and future for looking after that country uh, on behalf of everyone. And I myself, I'm on Wurundjeri country and every weekend that's within my, um, the Yarra River is within my um, 15 Ks that I'm allowed out from my front door. So I always go walking on the Yarra River and to this special place that still has significance and is a meeting place for Indigenous peoples today. So um, today we're going to hear from Julie Adams. Her paper is called Nothing Will Remain, Paul Montague's Collecting in the Montebello Islands. And I'd just like to say that I, I know a little bit about this story and it has all the hallmarks of it's an emotional roller coaster. It has personal triumphs and tragedies. It has the histories of empire and colonialism written all over it. It has overtones for those of us concerned about the environment under climate change. It basically has everything in it. So, Julie, over to you. Thank you. Andrea, wow, that was like a build up. Now I like feel the pressure to uh, totally deliver that. Oh, no, no, no. The story <laughs> does it all. And I forgot to say, Julie, of course, is a curator of Oceania at the British Museum. Sorry, Julie. <laughs> After okay. all of that, I forgot to say that. So, uh, BM, of course, is one of our partners. So, thank you very much, Julie. Just let me start. <clears throat> Can you see it full screen yet or just? No, we can just see the slides. Thanks. I will. Sorry, bear with me. Sorry, I just realized I was talking while I was on mute, which is not very clever. I said, no problem. If you just share again. Yeah. Ah, lost my, okay, here we go. Okay, it says you started sharing. So here it is, and then you just need to put it on slideshow. So if you go down to the bottom, yeah. Okay. That's it. All done. Always the technology it's dramas. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, so good morning from England. Um, although I'm over here on this side of the world and not on country, I just want to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous people of Western Australia, particularly the groups whose land is relevant to the subject of my talk today. Secondly, I'd just like to highlight um, that although I'm going to be talking about collecting practices, uh, that I am going to be talking about collecting practices from the early part of the 20th century, and as such, 
There's a couple of instances where I'll be um, reading a quote that includes language and terminology that we would deem inappropriate today. But as the talk is basically all about the trying to provide the historical context for the collection, I've made the decision to leave those um, particular quotes in. Finally, <clears throat> as I've already badly demonstrated, I'm trying to manage uh, the screens and my notes and everything, so please bear with me. Um, as Andrea said, uh, my name's Julie Adams. I'm a curator based at the British Museum where I work with the collections from the Oceania region. The research that I'm going to present to you today has its roots in a previous incarnation. When I worked as a uh, researcher, at the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology in Cambridge. I worked there on a project called Pacific Presences, Oceanic Art and European Museums, which ran from 2013 to 2018. Um, it was funded by the European Research Council and it was led by Professor Nicholas Thomas, who many of you will know. So Pacific Presences aimed to explore the extensive collections of art and artifacts from the Pacific region that are cared for in ethnography and world cultures museums across Europe. Our small team of researchers tried to make connections across collections, reconstructing the histories of particular art forms and their contexts, and investigating collections made by particular travelers and field workers, which were in many cases dispersed across numerous institutions, cities, countries, and sometimes continents. Above all, we endeavoured to connect collections with communities in the Pacific, and many islanders joined the project for periods as affiliated scholars and visitors. So the project was ambitious, both in terms of its breadth, in that it was focusing on collections from right across the Pacific region, it didn't include Australia, um, and uh, it was also very open in terms of its temporal scope. We included everything from early voyage collections right up to those made during the second half of the 20th century. And as a senior research fellow on that project, I was extremely lucky to have the opportunity to visit and study collections in Estonia, Germany, Austria, Russia, France, Ireland, Spain, and the Netherlands. Yet my main contribution to the publication outputs of Pacific Presences ended up being focused upon a collection that had been stored within the walls of the Cambridge Museum where I was based for over 100 years. So the collection was made by this man um, in 1914 in New Caledonia, Paul Dennis Montague. The collection consists of approximately 200 artifacts, a series of black and white photographs, a handwritten catalogue that accompanies the objects, a private expedition journal, the draft manuscript for a book titled Ethnographical Notes from the Wailu Valley, New Caledonia, a series of sound recordings made on wax cylinders, and a variety of other sundry papers. So although Pacific Presences had set out to reconstitute collections dispersed across multiple institutions, one of the lessons I learned working uh, on the Montague material was how collections can equally be dispersed within a single institution. Although all of Montague's objects, archives and images were catalogued and readily visible on the museum's database, they were stored away from each other in different parts of the building, as is frequently the case with collections, and thus had effectively been leading separate lives for the century that had passed since they were brought from New Caledonia and deposited in Cambridge by Montague. Finding things that aren't lost, as Nicholas Thomas puts it in his 2010 essay, The Museum as Method, is one of the key tasks of a curator or museum researcher. And so back in the early days of the Pacific Presences project, I set out to locate and reunite all of the dispersed Montague material with the aim of reconnecting the collection with Kanak people in New Caledonia. Um, here's just one of the um, spectacular objects that Montague collected during his time in New Caledonia, a human hair, wood and feather mask. So my task of reconnecting collections with uh, Kanak communities was enabled uh, via a long-standing working relationship with a Kanak colleague and archaeologist Francois Wadra. Francois and I have been working together since 2007, tracing collections of Kanak artifacts 
in UK museums and sharing images of objects with related tribes back in New Caledonia. After Francois made several trips to the UK in 2016, he and I traveled to the Wailu Valley in New Caledonia where Montague had spent a great deal of time. With us were two Canac curators from the Musée de Nouvelle Caledonie, as well as a New Zealand based photographer who came to document our work. And there in the Wailu Valley, we were able to spend time with communities from whom Montague had collected items, an experience which was at the same time rewarding, challenging, unexpected, uh, and um, ongoing really in terms of its significance. At some point during my research into Montague's collecting, I also became interested in other aspects of his life, his family, his upbringing, his schooling, the training he received in the natural sciences as a student at Cambridge University, and a zoological expedition he made prior to his New Caledonia one to Western Australia, which is the focus of my contribution to the Collecting the West project and what I will be focusing on um, for the remainder of my talk today. More than simply assembling the facts of his life, I wanted to really try and understand what drove him in his collecting and to explore how his personal life and experiences shaped the collections he made. Earlier this year, and embarrassingly, a decade after I started this research, I finally published, um, oh, you can't see it, I finally, <laughs> yeah, oh, there we go, uh, finally published um, my book, Museum Magic Memory, which tells the story of Montague. Um, in its pages, I try to weave together various strands that include biography, collecting history, museology, as well as document my own experiences of reconnecting collections with source communities in New Caledonia. In the book, I'm particularly interested in exploring the myriad legacies of Montague's collecting, or what I call the afterlives of collections. And again, that's something I want to try and touch on in the talk today. So I just wanted to set everything up with this um, somewhat lengthy context so that you can understand first and foremost my own positionality. I'm a curator who works with ethnographic collections from the Pacific Islands. I'm not a natural historian and neither am I, am I an expert in the history of Western Australia. So please bear with me if I point out things which are incredibly obvious to all of you. So what I want to do in the remainder of the talk is to give you an overview of Montague's collecting expedition to Western Australia. Then I want to try and situate his work within the Collecting the West's broader theoretical framework, which Alistair and Andrea laid out for us in the first seminar in this series a few weeks ago. In particular, I'm interested in the project's concern with the rise of collections as resources as well as the notion that hierarchies of value are often at play within museums. In their essay, Nature's Marvels, the value of collections extracted from colonial Western Australia, Andrea and Alistair remind us that by analysing collecting histories, we can begin, quote, to illuminate some of the ways that collections have been seen as a resource with which to produce particular kinds of cultural goods, producing in effect a kind of cultural economy. End quote. So it's these ideas of collections as resources, hierarchies of value, and the production of a cultural economy that I'm going to try and engage with today. <clears throat> so in 1912, Paul Montague was 22 years old and had recently completed his studies at Cambridge University. During his time in Cambridge, he'd undertaken several zoological collecting trips around the UK and was now ready to take on a more ambitious project. At Cambridge, Montague had come to know Alfred Court Haddon, who himself, of course, had undertaken research in the Torres Strait Islands, and who also had input into the planning of the 1910 Cambridge Anthropological Expedition to Western Australia. In an article published a year later in 1911, Haddon described Western Australia as a location that remained, quote, largely unopened. So in one way, it seems obvious that Haddon must have influenced Montague's selection of Western Australia as a suitable research site. However, it's also possible that Paul had long harboured a desire to travel to Australia. And there's some evidence to suggest that that is the case. 
In 1908, when he was a pupil at the rather unconventional Beedale School in England, the syllabus included a special project focusing on the Australian continent. The project required students to assemble a portfolio of work, including essays on Australia's environment, climate and history, and to produce illustrations of its flora and fauna. And some of this work survives today in the school's archives. In one essay, a pupil imagines themselves as a recently arrived migrant to Australia, writing home to a fictitious relative back in England. Dear Elizabeth, this imagined correspondence begins. Out here in Australia, it's very different to England. It seems so dusty and hot. All the vegetation is different too. It's really all scrub and gum trees. The animals are very queer. They seem so small and funny." End quote. In an essay on Australian history, one of Montague's fellow pupils writes, quote, the history of Australia is one of exploration and peaceful settlement. There is little or no history to record before the coming of the white man, end quote. For these pupils, Australia was an alien land, utterly unimaginable without comparison to England. And this strangeness or othering of the vegetation and the animals also extends to Australia's indigenous inhabitants. Um, and here's a piece of work from the archives of the school. In this essay titled simply Natives, one pupil asserts, quote, the native Australians bear a certain resemblance to the Negroes, but are lower in the scale of civilization. Since the arrival of Europeans in their country, they are rapidly dying out, end quote. And below this, stuck into the book, they've um, carefully shaded a map of the Australian continent to illustrate where indigenous Australians can still be found clinging to their traditional ways of life. To really try and capture a sense of this educational zeitgeist, if you like, the school's prospectus provides an overview of their vision for the teaching of history. It reads, quote, our object in teaching history is to arouse interest, to store the mind with clear impressions and noble thoughts. Whatever may be the best history teaching for grown students, for the young, it must be living, it must be personal, and it must be dramatic, end quote. So what I'm trying to demonstrate through citing these um, kind of very specific examples is to try and give a sense of what children like Montague were learning about Australia in their schooling. And Beedales was the type of school that educated the British elite, the types of people who would go on to study at Oxford and Cambridge and then go out into the world um, and have a huge influence on, on um, the fields that they went into, as indeed Montague did. <clears throat> So just a few years after leaving Beedales, um, Montague graduated from Cambridge in Natural Sciences and decided to undertake his first major zoological expedition. He chose um, the Montebello Islands for that expedition off the Pilbara coast of North northwestern Australia. And after the long voyage out from England, he arrived in Fremantle on the 30th of April 1912, and that same day met with Bernard Woodward then director of the Western Australian Museum and Art Gallery. Alistair and Andrea have described this era as one when the museum's foundational collections were constituted and a period when its director and lead curator were trying to, quote, fill the gaps in the collections of Western Australia's natural history. So no doubt with this purpose in mind, Bernard Woodward had already been in touch with Montague prior to leaving England and, um, Come up with a kind of contract with him uh, which the Western Australian Museum would donate some funds to Montague's expedition in return for taking ownership of a portion of the specimens that he was collect. So a few weeks after um, arriving in, in Fremantle, Montague departed for the Montebellos and established a base on Hermite Island that would serve as his headquarters for the next three months. In addition for collecting for the museum in Perth, he was also contracted to supply specimens to the Natural History Museum in London and the Zoology Museum in Cambridge. So the pressure was on and he worked relentlessly day and night using lanterns in the hours of darkness to catch insects and moths. He spent patient hours documenting colonies of northern white-headed ospreys laying their eggs on Tremorwheel Island and went out on a boat to collect crustacea as well as other marine life, including 
collecting several specimens of shovel-nosed rays. These are his photographs, by the way, I should say. Sorry, to make that clear. Um, he identified two new subspecies of birds and quickly informed the Austral Avian Journal of his, dis of his discoveries. And when he was not actively collecting, his time was taken up with preparing and preserving specimens, fighting a sometimes losing battle to get to them before they were eaten by rats. Among the specimens he collected were several spectacled hair wallabies, including this example which survives in the collections of the Museum of Zoology in Cambridge. Writing about uh, these creatures in an article he published in the Geographical Journal, he writes, quote, it's unlikely that the spectacled hair wallaby will exist for many years longer, as it's one of the most defenseless animals that can well be imagined. It's easily dislodged from its hiding place amongst the spinifex, from which it rises in an awkward fashion, tripping up and rolling over before getting away. Though it's able to hop swiftly for a short distance, it rapidly becomes exhausted and is not difficult to obtain by simply running after it and catching it by the tail." End quote. So this narrative of scarcity, of there being a limited time left to collect before species became extinct, becomes the dominant narrative for Montague's work in the Montebello Islands. In his published article, he concludes that although the Montebellos is, quote, a somewhat barren region, it's of great importance that the fauna of these small islands should be studied and recorded as soon as possible, for the indigenous animals are disappearing so rapidly before introduced species that, in a very few years' time, he says, little or nothing will remain. The notion of looming extinction, both in relation to zoological collecting and also anthropological collecting, has been written extensively about by others. But here I just want to simply point out that it is this notion of scarcity or rarity that can be understood as the first sphere of value assigned to Montague's Montebello collections. So soon after Montague concluded his expedition and return to Perth, he received a formal letter of thanks from Bernard Woodward, who wrote expressing gratitude and the highest appreciation of his trustees, who were, he writes, particularly pleased with the collection of specimens they'd received. Sometime after, and perhaps as a way to further demonstrate his satisfaction, Woodward either presented or allowed Montague to select a number of Aboriginal artifacts from the museum's collections to take home with him to England. The exact numbers uh, are somewhat confused, but records suggest that somewhere between 19 and 28 Western Australian Aboriginal artifacts passed from the WA Museum into Montague's hands. In their essay, Nature's Marvels, Alistair and Andrea note that this practice of trading out what were then considered possibly to be duplicates from the collection was a regular modus operandi for director Bernard Woodward. He managed the collection as a resource through which he sought to insert Western Australia into an in international marketplace of collectors and collections. Andrea and Alistair also note that although Woodward was often prepared to release specimens or artifacts from the collections, they most often tended to be those from other areas of Australia, but here in Montague's case, Woodward seems to be making a deliberate value judgment, which is that he's prepared to let these ethnographic items go in return for receiving the zoological specimens from the Montebello Islands. So while the natural history specimens are kept within the state and used to tell a story of Western Australia to Western Australians, the Aboriginal objects in this instance are deemed less valuable and are allowed to leave the museum, the state, and even the country without knowledge of what might happen to them next. Similarly, what's interesting here is that these objects are not in this instance being used to garner relationships between institutions, but are rather presented to a specific individual. And this is one of the, um, on screen now, this is one of the pieces that um, were was presented to Montague. And I think what's interesting from the paperwork I've seen is that you can see it was actually registered into the collections in September 1912, but then very soon afterwards, literally a matter of weeks, it's out again <laughs> um, uh, in October 1912 when, when Montague takes it back to the UK. So what 
happened to these artifacts in the short term is that they left the public realm of the museum and entered the private realm of the domestic and the familial as Montague presented them to his father, Leopold A. Agar Dennis Montague. So Leopold was uh, quite a well-known historian and author of children's books. Um, he was a polymath, basically, but above everything, he was a collector. And in particular, he was an avid collector of weapons, which he mounted on the walls of the Montague family home in Devon. And we know that Paul gifted the artifacts to his father because many of them appear in a book that Leopold published in 1921 with the now unfortunate title, Weapons and Implements of Savage Races. In the book, Leopold illustrates particular objects and writes, quote, the specimens here described were all brought home by my son, the late Paul D. Montague, and were either obtained by him from the natives or presented to him by the Western Australian Museum at Perth. They are therefore accurately localised, which adds considerably to the scientific value of the collection. So here Paul's father, Leopold, is describing the scientific, uh, scientific value to the objects gifted to him, noting that it's their ability to be accurately located in the Australian landscape that is creating value in this instance. In fact, the, the work of localising the objects had largely been done by previous collectors um, and had been recorded carefully in the registers of the Western Australian Museum. Although Leopold claims that Paul obtained not objects from natives, I can only find a couple of instances where that was actually the case. One, a spearhead, which Paul apparently picks up from a deserted native camp at Mindaroo near the Ashburton River. And this shield, which um, this is a page from, from Leopold's book. Sorry, it's a bit blurred. Um, and the image depicts a shield which Paul apparently bought from a native at Onslow. Apart from these particular, these two particular examples, the remainder of the objects um, represent the pieces that were traded out from the WA collection. So in other words, have not been collected by Montague himself. So following Leopold Montague's death in 1940, his vast collections, including the Western Australian artifacts, were presented to the Royal Albert Memorial Museum in Exeter, which was close to the Montague family home. So there's another shift in the status of these pieces as they leave the domestic realm of the walls of the Montague family home and make their way in, back into a museum setting um, and the Royal Albert Memorial Museum. And today, that museum displays a small selection of Leopold's collections in a gallery called Finders Keepers, where the, basically the, the, the aim of the gallery is to kind of highlight the collecting and the lives of local people and tell stories about how they amassed their collections. And the shield, <clears throat> which was apparently acquired from um, by Paul in Onslow, has been separated out from that group and selected for special display in what is kind of like a wall of wonders, a recurring display strategy by the museum design firm Ralph Applebaum, for those who are uh, in the know. And they created this kind of uh, wall of wonders, picking together treasures, aesthetically pleasing treasures from around the world to create a kind of wow factor when you walk into the museum and this shield appears in that wall of wonders. But what happened to the zoological specimens that Montague collected in the Montebello Islands and which Woodward had prized so highly? Well, as is often the case with natural history collections, Quite a few of them have not survived to the present day, but those that have survived include five spectacled hare wallabies, two black rats, several fish and other marine life. Um, and those are um, held in, still held in the Western Australian Museum. And I visited the stores in 2018 and saw some of those specimens. Um, but a lot of them have you know, gone by the wayside, um, including most of the birds that he collected. A similar story is repeated in Cambridge where only around 20 specimens have survived, including the spectacled hair wallaby we saw earlier. At the Natural History Museum in London, very few specimens are traceable on the museum's catalogue. 
So it might be tempting to conclude that Montague's narrative of a looming absence of the Montebello's indig island's indigenous species has indeed been borne out, despite the fact that the collections had been supposedly saved by removing them from their original context and transferring them into a museum setting. But this is one of the things I love most about museum work, of course, it's not that straightforward, it's always more complicated. And this tiny, fragile moth, also in the collections of the Western Australian Museum, is one survivor um, and a legacy of Montague's collecting. This is my fourth photograph. Um, and I just, it's such a museum, great museum photograph, the object, the moth is completely swamped by its labels. Um, but uh, this moth is a holotype, meaning it was classified as the first known example of its type, making it a valuable specimen that identifies it as a new species. Even if a better specimen is subsequently found, the holotype can never be superseded. The moth was named Melicleptria albivinata Montague. Although its status as a holotype certainly gives it value, another aspect of its history makes it even more significant. 38 years after Montague left the Montebello Islands on the 3rd of October, 1952, the islands were the site of detonation for Britain's first atomic bomb test. And in 1956, four years after the initial testing took place, the British government decided to push ahead and test two further bombs. The result, of course, was huge devastation, um, extraordinary damage wrought upon the island's habitat and its wildlife. So this small, fragile moth, uh, a survivor, has kind of taken on additional layers of value for us today in the present than, you know, it could possibly have been imagined at the time it was collected, representing as it does that pre-atomic moment in the era of, uh, pre-atomic era in the history of the Montebello Islands. So what I've been trying to demonstrate here is the multiple spheres that museum objects might pass through and how these shift and turn over time in frequently unintended and unanticipated ways. Whatever audience Montague might have imagined for his work in New Caledonia, for example, in his collecting of objects, his meticulous documentation, and his drafting of a book about Kanak culture, it seems certain that he would not have imagined his audience to be Kanak people themselves. Yet today, that is very much the case. Similarly, the surviving zoological specimens from the Montebello Islands continue to have a legacy beyond anything Montague could have imagined when he departed Australia in 1913, and they continue to have the potential to reveal new understandings and new knowledge in the future. So when I was some way into writing my book, I began to get a sense of what I was trying to achieve after about five years. Um, I set out to engage critically with museum collections and specifically with one particular collector, but to some extent, I found that a little bit of an um, intellectual dead end in that, by what I mean really is it's, it's easy to get sucked into the um, our contemporary frame of criticizing collectors from our position um, in the 21st century for actions in the 20th century. Um, and of course, you can't not um, do that and you can't not be aware of Montague's position as a white male operating in a colonial context where racial hierarchies and class status enabled everything he was able to achieve but in a way <clears throat> once you've done that I guess I'm wondering where that leaves you. Um, so what I was trying to do really was to, to see if by looking closely and holistically at his life if it might um, bring something different. Um, and in this way, I became interested in what happened to Montague after the conclusion of his New Caledonia expedition in 1914 and the outbreak of World War I. In summary, following his return to England, he enlisted and ended up flying as a pilot in the Royal Flying Corps in Salonika, in what is today North Macedonia. Arriving in the region in March 1917, he was shot down and killed six months later on the 29th of October. 
his body has never been recovered, but his name is remembered on the Salonika campaign's memorial to the missing near the border between Greece and North Macedonia. On the day he was killed, he was flying solo without a parachute. The British forces resisted issuing parachutes to pilots, despite them having been successfully tested, because they were concerned that this might encourage pilots to abandon their expensive aircraft. Unlike the French, who sent their newest aircraft to the Salonika campaign, the Royal Flying Corps were forced to fly in slow, old and cumbersome machines, which one historian has described as being wholly unsuitable for aerial combat. The British sent their latest aircraft directly to the Western Front. The Salonika campaign was not considered a priority and the lives of pilots who flew there somehow not as valuable. Despite the fact that Montague's body has never been found, unusually it was photographed post-mortem by a German soldier. This image, a copy of which is included in the Imperial War Museum's collections, was the main reference point for his life when I first started my research and entered his name into Google. This image came up. So in a way, Montague himself has become a catalogued symbol of loss, registered and accessible via a museum's online catalogue. Now, I just want to kind of say, I'm not trying to make simplistic comparisons between histories of loss um, or try and divert attention away from the consequences of colonialism and the very real legacies of empire for the people, as well as for museums, uh, that we're wrestling with in the present. Rather, in my research, I have become interested in the writings of Michael Rothberg, in particular, a work called Multidirectional Memory, if anyone's familiar with that. And in that work, he rejects the notion that memory is a finite resource within which different historical events must compete for attention in the public's mind. So rather than seeing historical events as like, for example, he talks about slavery and the Holocaust. So rather than seeing them as somehow um, unrelated or indeed in competition with each other for attention, he argues that memory is an infinite resource which can function multidirectionally, where the remembering of one set of historical events can an increase and sharpen our awareness of another. So thinking about Montague multidirectionally, might allow us to see poignant correspondence between the small Montebello's moth survival in a post-atomic era and Montague's own demise in the Great War. Suppose my suggestion or question really at the end of the paper, this paper is whether we could think about museum collections in a similar way, in other words, as infinite resources which can bring into focus multiple histories, multiple lives and losses, in interconnected multidirectional ways, and in so doing help us to better understand and how, and more importantly, why collections have come to exist. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. I still find it a really strong story, even though I have heard elements of it before. You didn't disappoint. So, really significant themes in there about the idea of collections as resources for any number of things, really. And I, I, I personally really like your use of Roth there at the end. I think that makes total sense. And I really liked the way in which you very carefully suggested that it was not enough to just critique past collecting and the values that underpinned it. I, I think that's spot on, Julie. I think we need to find ways to get away from that. I mean, it's it becomes a tired critique, doesn't it? And you kind of don't find anything new if, if all we're doing is repeating the mantra. Mm -hmm. So so going to Roth to to suggest that there are multi-directional ways of both remembering and understanding these collections, I think is a very powerful metaphor. Mm -hmm. 
I kind of ended up there partly for sort of personal reasons in that I came to, um, oh, sorry, I'm just reading Alistair's comment that his house is being renovated. Like, like, there's something going on in his background, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, through research and through kind of trying to build this holistic life, um, I came in to know um, some of Montague's descendants. He didn't have children for obvious reasons. He's um, had three surviving nieces when I started the research. And I kind of felt like, you know, I came to, through them, have this sense of this presence, this absent presence um, that had been in their family growing up, never obviously um, meeting this person, but having this kind of shadow in their, in their lives which reminded me again of kind of the present absences of museum collections often. But um, anyway, I, I felt like it wasn't doing justice to the past or the history, really, if, if I just took that kind of route of uh, Montague's uh, kind of, you know, stereotype of, of the time. Um, so anyway, that's, mm. that's sort of what I was looking for, to try and find a way to, perhaps I didn't even do it successfully, but bring those kind of biographical elements into the story to complexify, to complexify it. Well, I'll, I'll open it up um, as people are thinking of, of questions, but I think it is successful. And in part because, because you don't reduce the story to that critique and there's all these other elements there. So, so the moth is a heliotype, yeah, but it is also a deeply cultural object because of the context of its collecting and the figure who collected it and the nuclear age. So um, coming to you right next, Linda. So, I mean, that's just one example, but you, you, you deal with nature culture divides here. You need to mm -hmm. deal with past present. You deal with presence absence. You deal with history, remembrance, memorializing through his father's book in a way you know, and futures. So I think there's there's an incredible amount going on there, which is just so much more than what than if you just had critiqued him as a white imperial male collector, which would be so easy to do. So my hat off to you. I think these are, are really hard things to achieve. Anyway, Linda. Hello. You're on mute, Linda. So Linda Young, Julie, is a former colleague of mine at Deakin, and she's an expert on historic houses and collections and material culture. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea. But in fact, before that, I was thinking 40, nearly 40 years ago, I spent some years at the WA Museum in its new history department, when it was the only history department in an Australian museum. Uh, look, Julie, it was just great to hear the bigger story because I read the little blog story about the moth and I was so touched by it. I, I, I Wikipedia'd up um, Bedale's school and, and the whole vision, magical, wonderful. Uh, and the fact that he goes on, oh, what a shame that Paul Montague uh, died in the war. Yeah. Uh, look, what I what I wanted to contribute here is is a comment on your uh, your identification of the theme of absence. Excuse me, my um, I need to cough a bit. <coughs> <coughs> mm. uh, it it uh, reminded me very much of uh, Tom Griffiths in Hunters and Collectors uh, discussing. The, the, the whole scheme of, uh, of collecting Australia uh, and, and popping it in museums and other collect, uh, material, places of material storage uh, to a lot on the, on the lines of zoology, uh, natural science uh, and its weirdness. You know, it's upside down trees which where the bark falls off, not the leaves and it's, it's uh, the upside down seasons and the absence of anything except natural history to the exclusion, of course, of indigenous people. 
who were represented in collections all right. Tom, Tom has a, a whole vast section on stone tools and the, the, the phenomenon of, of collecting stone tools. There it is that uh, inevitably perhaps studies of Australian material in museums uh, ends up in the, the same frame of the absent Aboriginal people, whatever the era, well, until the 1980s, absence, absence, the natural history masks, masks the people. Mm. Mm. That's a really interesting point. Yeah, thank you for that. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I think that also, I mean, in my experience working with Pacific collections, it's it's often a similar story as well. Um, and that, that was the irony of working on a project called Pacific Presences, unless Nicholas Thomas, which could be possible, had already thought of this in advance. Um, but we ended up um, thinking more about absences than we did about presences. Um, and I think that, you know, like for, for all of us who work in museums, that that is such a reality of your day-to-day -day work is trying to, um, you know, fill absences, basically. Um, Mm. Yeah. yeah, just trying to think, you know, there's so, so much in, in the record of the WA Museum, there are so many letters to say the police commissioner asking him to collect various ethnographic mm -hmm. objects with the entire purpose of giving them away as gifts. And as late as the 1930s, they were asking for things like boomerangs. They'd run out of boomerangs in the storage of the WA Museum to give away to various visiting dignitaries. So this this what you were talking about in relation to Woodward giving um, Aboriginal material culture away as gifts. I mean, it went on for years. Mm -hmm. And they would literally use the resources of the state to collect that kind of material only to send it out all mm. the time yeah i mean for me it was striking that those pieces were actually registered into the collections and then yeah again um yeah. i know it was, at the british museum as Alan was, sort of ran, i said the museum was an entrepot i mean it was it was it was totally mercantile you can't yeah. stuff came in and it went out yeah um and, yeah, at the British Museum, they had, um, they accepted, you know, there's a, a long history of accepting objects that were, they weren't registered, but they were taken in and given this status duplicate, um, which were then kind of put to use in this network of uh, trading and exchanging, and there's all kinds of, mm -hmm. of that going on. So it's, but what was interesting to me, and I don't know if, if this is, you know, kind of specific to WA Museum or if it happened elsewhere, but that Woodward was actually, you know, registering objects. So they are actually in the collection and then they go out again. Um, whereas, yeah, at the British Museum, we're still, we're still dealing with the legacy of those duplicates. And that's a really, that's kind of interesting museological point as well is what, what's, what, what are those objects? What is the status of those pieces? You know, they're not collection pieces yet. Many of them, lots of Australian pieces, for example, have been in the museum for you know over a hundred years. Um, anyway, yeah, museological challenges. Absolutely, I don't know, Linda. Do you have your hand up again? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So do you have the answer to that? One. The other, other museums. Spot on. Yes. Yes. Register museum and then collections have been. Museum collections have been currency uh, in further acquisitions almost everywhere, especially in the New World, in all the Australian museums. Uh, the, 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 <laughs> you know, it's, it's, an, it's another currency. <laughs> and, and so for that matter, were Aboriginal body parts, and as we know, only too well. Yeah, yeah. And so were natural history specimens as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, well, of, often, in fact, to bring in uh, natural history specimens from other parts of the, the world, of the old world, bringing them to here in exchange for, for Australian natural history and uh, material culture. 
Yeah, I'm hoping I might get to touch on some of that with in my talk. Um, haven't written it yet, but <laughs> I'm planning to look at um, the exchanges between the WA Museum and this Italian uh, director of a museo zoological there, Giglioli. And so he would basically, material would go from Perth to Florence and then from Florence to Washington, to the Smithsonian, mm -hmm. you know, and what the WA Museum would get in, instead was antiquities, uh, ancient um, bits of yes. Roman. Yes. Yes. Oil and Rachel, and Rachel Hunt from Cambridge just posted in the comments that Von Hugel in Cambridge was doing the same with unregistered duplicates that they're now working through, but Cambridge also did have regular um, correspondence with um, Giglioli, so I think, yeah, he was one of those museum it's officers. interesting, isn't it? Like, pretty hilarious guy yeah. from what I've read. So that's interesting, oh. Rachel. So in Cambridge it wasn't registered, whereas in the WA Museum it got registered and then it got... <laughs> Well, not even the accession, the accession, it just went on its way. But um, um, oh, so you know Giglioli as well, um, Rachel. Yeah, uh, as well known. But um, yeah, uh, it's kind of interesting that the in we all often talk, think of collections as dealing with either the rare or the representative. But here, the duplicate is an interesting complication on those isn't it because the duplicate then has value because it can be exchanged absolutely yeah it's uh, the questions if not, i have to go to my departmental staff meeting but, uh, it is almost um on the hour as well yeah so oh darren i think you had a maybe just a final question from darren Jorgensen. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll try and be quick, given that okay, departments sorry. and demanders. Um, I, I just wanted to uh, um, ask Julie just a general question about the value of keeping um, museum collections organised according to the collector. And because I guess here yeah, a lot of um, collections are in Australia are really at the moment being dismantled and, and re repatriated to people and so they'll be then reclassified as they re get returns to keeping places in communities. Um, and that's, you know, a very recent sort of phenomenon that's really um, taking hold within Australian institutions. And I just wondered if you had any general comments from working in the BM or just personally about, you know, the value of, um, collections being organised according to the original collector. Yeah, that's interesting. <clears throat> In fact, mm, I'm not aware of anywhere that actually does store or collections in that way. They're usually stored by kind of like material, so archives in one place, photographs in another, um, objects in another and that's kind of what I was trying to suggest at the beginning of the talk is that I think a lot of the work that needs to, to go on in museums um, and collecting the West project is, is doing that is is trying to like reunite almost um, collections you know dispersed collections uh, in a way even if it's not physically but conceptually reuniting them with one person so that you can then better understand the history of how that collection came to be made. What happens to that collection after that in terms of, is it a resource for museums in the future? Is it a resource for indigenous communities? Um, that's a kind of much bigger question that I don't feel I can do justice to in two minutes, but uh, obviously I think, um, you know, what, what I tried to do with Montague's work is to try and bring a holistic vision of him and the collection together, basically to make it a more useful resource for multiple um, people, including, and especially in fact, people um, in a way, in my kind of experience working in New Caledonia is that communities want that information and they want it in a holistic way. They want to understand who the hell was this person? Why were, what did they think they were doing? Why, why were they taking this stuff? Um, and that brings with it all, all kinds of, you know, very interesting challenges for lots of, for lots of museums and museum professionals. But I think um, 
yeah, that's where we are. And I think personally, I think it's a, a thinking of collections in, in that way as resources for, for Indigenous communities is absolutely a priority. I don't know if that answered the question, but hopefully in some way. Thank you, Julian. Thanks, Darren. Julie, thank you so much for a wonderful paper. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Just before you disappear next week, Paula will be giving her paper on the lost pictorialists. And as behind her, it will be on photographs. So we're also traveling through a range of material culture as we do this series of talks. So see you next week. And thank you so much for your paper, Julie, and everybody for your questions and for coming along and being part of this. Thanks for the Thank opportunity. You. Thank you. Bye. Pleasure.